Hey everybody, Dave here. A quick reminder that in addition to the CyberWire podcasts that you know and love, we also publish our CyberWire daily news brief. It's got all the day's cybersecurity news and stories, much more than we can fit in our daily podcast. It's free, and you can check it out and sign up to have it delivered to your inbox every day when you visit our website, thecyberwire.com. That's our CyberWire daily news brief. Do check it out. The Norsk Hydro recovery continues with high marks for transparency. Some notes on the challenges of deterrence in cyberspace from yesterday's CyberSec DC conference, along with context for U.S. skepticism about Huawei hardware. CookieBot says the EU is out of compliance with GDPR, its sites infested with data scraping ad tech. Google and Facebook get, if not a haircut, at least a trim in EU and U.S. courts. And some animad versions concerning digital courtship displays. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. Recorded Future is the real-time threat intelligence company whose patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web to develop information security intelligence that gives analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. And when analytical talent is as scarce and pricey as it is today, every enterprise can benefit from technology that makes your security teams more productive than ever. We here at the CyberWire have long been subscribers to Recorded Futures Cyber Daily, and if it helps us, we're confident it will help you too. Subscribe today and stay a step or two ahead of the threat. Go to recordedfuture.com slash cyberwire to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. That's recordedfuture.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, March 20th, 2019. Norsk Hydro has made significant strides toward recovery from yesterday's Locker Goga infestation. The company said this morning that it had recovered many of its affected systems and is on its way toward restoring normal, stable operations. The disruptions had affected both business and production systems. Some speculation about nation-state or hacktivist involvement aside, the emerging consensus seems to be that this was low-level, commodity criminal activity with far-reaching effects. We heard from CrowdStrike's vice president of intelligence, Adam Myers, who wrote that Lockar Goga was also behind the infection of the French engineering company Altran in January of this year. Myers wrote, quote, While details of the Norsk Hydro incident are still developing, CrowdStrike Intelligence has been able to identify a new sample of the Lockar Goga ransomware that was uploaded to a public malware repository in two zip files from an IP address based in Oslo, Norway, end quote. Norsk Hydro is engaged in the electricity-hungry production of aluminum. Cyber VP of Industrial Security Phil Nere pointed out to us in an email that manufacturers like Norsk Hydro have some particular concerns about ransomware. He said, quote, Downtime is measured in millions of dollars per day, and companies producing metals or chemicals are at additional risk should production disruption cause safety and environmental incidents. End quote. Norsk Hydro itself is getting pretty high marks for the speed and transparency of its response to the incident. Drago CEO Robert M. Lee has tweeted Norsk a thumbs up in particular for their transparency. He offers a simultaneous thumbs down, that's two thumbs way, way down, to those in the industry who would use the incident as FUD fodder to flack their products. We were able to attend the inaugural meetings of CyberSec DC in Washington yesterday. Their focus was on the connection between economic development, particularly the rapidly advancing tech sector, and cybersecurity, particularly as that linkage is evolving along NATO's eastern flank. Sponsored by the Center for European Policy Analysis, CEPA, and the Kosciusko Institute, the conference's announced goal was to advance the transatlantic quest for cyber trust. The discussion inevitably turned to the threat of hybrid war from Russia, something of which the 12 nations of the Three Seas group are uneasily aware. The Three Seas Initiative is a cooperative arrangement among the Central and Eastern European nations that stretch from the Baltic to the Black and Adriatic Seas. 
Austria, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. With the exception of formerly neutral Austria, these states are all either former Warsaw Pact countries or former Soviet republics, and so are very much attuned to the risky ministrations of what several panelists called our friends to the east. Several of the speakers pointed out that the challenge the Russian adversary poses is in operations that fall below the threshold of armed conflict. While NATO has made it clear that cyber attacks can trigger the collective defense the alliance's Article 5 commits its members to, cyber operations are still too new for there to be a clear set of proportionate responses. The participants recommended full use of the NATO toolbox, including diplomatic and economic tools. And they argued that imposition of costs need not, and probably should not, be symmetric. That is, threatened retaliation for cyber attacks need not confine itself to cyber counterattacks. The other challenge the conference took up was the different, more long-term threat that China poses as it continues to advance its position in the global technology marketplace. In this respect, Robert L. Strayer, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cyber and International Communications and Information Policy at the U.S. Department of State, had some observations that place the well-known American reservations about participation by companies like Huawei and 5G networks into context. These are worth mentioning, as they're often glossed over in discussions of the controversies around Huawei. Strayer observed that vendors from countries that subject their companies to extrajudicial processes are fundamentally untrustworthy and should be viewed with particular suspicion with respect to participation in 5G networks. Such extrajudicial processes would include non-appealable demands to contribute to state surveillance and espionage activities. The much-expanded attack surface 5G will present makes accepting this risk a high-stakes proposition, and Strayer argued that no source code review will be sufficient to reveal all the problems equipment from such companies may bring with it. He offered two other economic reasons to be wary of Chinese companies, and specifically of Huawei. Its engineering seems not to be up to par, and that while the equipment might be cheaper up front, it's likelier to be costlier over its life cycle. Thus, Strayer found it surprising that Europe flirted more with Huawei than it did with European champions like Ericsson or Nokia, and he also argued that the financial terms under which Chinese equipment is being offered are unrealistic and ultimately inadequate to sustaining a competitive market. An observation we heard from folks on the ground at this year's RSA conference was that much of the marketing hype surrounding AI and machine learning had died down quite a bit. Landon Lewis is CEO of security firm Pondurance, and he joins us to share his thoughts on our relationship with AI. I think that if we can look back at behavioral analytics as nearly a, a concept of identifying suspicious behaviors and then marrying both humans and technology to attempt to, to uncover that. In the past, there were enough technologies and not enough people. And essentially now, you know, the, there's a capability of almost I would look at it as enhanced or advanced behavioral analytics um, that, that have come to the market. I look at AI or any technology or tool as more of an extension of hands in a way to create you know, more efficient processes for eliminating some of the, the risks that uh, the market's facing. So, I mean, walk me through in your estimation, what is the appropriate place for AI in an organization? Where, where does it sit uh, in the, the, the stack of, of tools that folks have available to them? Typically anywhere where it's easy to understand good data and bad data. And what I mean by that, we've seen, I think we're at the end of this market, but it was termed as next generation endpoint or the EDR space. And, you know, there were some early adopters in that space of leveraging what they're calling AI. Essentially, they're able to run a, a bunch of binaries that they know are bad. And what, what I mean by that is they're, they were able to essentially go out to virus total and say, let's download everything that, that has uh, a bad score. If we download everything with a bad score and then we can download things that have a good score, we're able to separate good from bad. And we can build a model around bad and we can build a model around good. And then it's all about the gray area in between, right? That kind of makes it a differentiator. 
there's a lot more complexity to that. That's a simplified model of essentially what you would try to do on a network um, or what you might try to do with log data that a machine generates. So anything that you could separate good and bad from, um, and, and there has to be a large quantity of that data, um, the closer you are to building something that's you know more AI, machine learning driven that, that can help a SOC analyst or, or an individual engineer. But what about uh, intuition? You know, I, 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 I've heard where uh, folks have described how um, they'll look at some data or look at a report or something and they'll say, uh, something just doesn't feel right here. I can't quite put my finger on it, but uh, there's something that I feel like I should spend more time with. Is that an area where AI comes up short or, or does can AI sometimes surprise us? I believe if you've got the models trained appropriately from a futuristic standpoint, uh, or, or we're at least moving in that direction, where some type of event could basically have uh, suspicious indicators that, that your models could basically kind of uh, provide tips to your analyst, right? So again, more of an extension of the hand of saying, this is suspicious and here is why. I think it behooves us really to start explaining to an analyst what it is about that, right? So essentially, you've got to say, how was that model built and translate that back into something that an analyst understands? So the AI can say, hey, I flagged this and here are the reasons why I think this needs a second look from you. That's one of the the most difficult pieces, right, is you have to go back to, okay, well, who built this model and what type of events was it looking at for me to understand as an analyst, I have this event and it's saying, you know, suspicious activity. How can I go layers deeper? So the point ends up being you've got to have an analyst with the skill level that can almost move backwards, right? And not be, you know, a data scientist to, to really understand like why the model may be flagging it. I think AI is something that's typically going to help us. I believe describing it as a silver bullet is somewhat dangerous. And I believe that humans are still required to train the models that make AI more useful. I do believe in the long run, it's going to, to help us essentially extend the hands of, of our staff. That's Landon Lewis from Pondurance. Physician, heal thyself. Security firm CookieBot has looked into EU official government services sites and determined that a surprisingly large fraction of them leak personal information of EU citizens to various third parties in ways that contravene the EU's GDPR regime. ZDNet calls it an infestation of third-party ad tech scripts. The EU has fined Google's parent Alphabet 1.49 billion euros, that's about $1.7 billion, for anti-competitive restriction of other companies' ads. This is the last of three formal EU antitrust actions against the company. It's by no means a business killer, since Alphabet has deep pockets, but it's a large judgment. Some U.S. politicians have already pointed out that maybe more aggressive antitrust action, like a breakup, should be in the cards, but so far that's preliminary posturing. Facebook has settled a lawsuit by agreeing to change its advertising platform, to reduce the possibility of discrimination in housing and employment. This affects, in particular, use of such user demographics as race, age, and gender. The number and volume of DDoS attacks dropped significantly after the FBI took down 15 DDoS for hire sites in December. Researchers from NexusGuard found that, in the fourth quarter of 2018, the number of DDoS attacks sank by 11%, and the average size of these attacks fell by 85%. So bravo, FBI, but everybody else? Well, don't get cocky, kids. And finally, those who have followed the National Enquirer's coverage of Amazon Chief Bezos' online courtship display, the one Mr. Bezos gamely addressed in his No Thank You, Mr. Pecker blog post, may have wondered where Mr. Pecker's inquirer obtained the texts that constituted this particular expression of ardor. Speculation had run toward Saudi Arabia, the White House, hackers, everywhere. But it appears that the entire transaction may have been much more prosaic than that. The peacock may have spread his metaphorical tail feathers to inspire reciprocal feelings in the peahen, but reports in the New York Post's page 6 say that the inquirer paid the peahen's brother... That would be the Peacock's boyfriend-in-law. Some 200000 to send them the goods. Pro tip, during courtship, send flowers. 
half-baked cookies. Sure, they're traditional, but they're almost always appreciated. These kids today. And now a word from our sponsor, Looking Glass Cyber Solutions. When it comes to digital business risk, you don't want a general admission perspective. Get a backstage pass for the Looking Glass Digital Business Risk Roadshow this spring to learn the industry latest on effective third-party risk management tactics to protect your employees, customers, and brand, taking a proactive security posture to combat today's sophisticated threat actors, and a cyber criminal mastermind's insights on manipulating your organization's cyber strengths and weaknesses. Come see Looking Glass in a city near you. The tour includes Atlanta, Charlotte, Chicago, San Francisco, New York City, D.C., and Houston. They hope to see you at the show. To learn more about the Roadshow and register, visit their website, lookingglasscyber.com. That's lookingglasscyber.com. And we thank Looking Glass for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Dr. Charles Clancy. He's the director of the Hume Center for National Security and Technology at Virginia Tech. Dr. Clancy, welcome back. Um, I saw an article come by recently, and this was about a new GPS satellite that was uh, recently launched successfully. Uh, and they're they're uh, touting this as being the first GPS-3 satellite. Uh, what are we talking about here? What makes GPS-3 special? So GPS technology is, is 40 years old at this point. Um, the military has been launching satellites uh, since the, the, well, planning satellites since the late 1970s and, and launching since the 1980s, and has been incrementally improving the technology uh, as they have launched more and more satellites. Uh, GPS Block 3 has been in planning now for uh, over a decade, and we've just now finally seen uh, the first satellite launch. Some of the, the features of GPS-3 um, include um, a higher signal uh, strength. The, the actual signal that's transmitted by the GPS satellite is stronger. Uh, that means you'll be able to lock on to it in, uh, uh, like inside. The, the goal is to try and get more indoor coverage for GPS. Uh. Another feature is that they are transmitting a companion signal uh, that actually is a, a guide to help you uh, find the, the the GPS satellites. Uh, if you used, uh, say, a Garmin GPS uh, probably 15 years ago, uh, you may recall that it, it could take a couple minutes to actually lock onto the GPS satellites. Sure. Um, now we have assisted GPS technology where essentially your cell phone is using uh, cell tower data to try and uh, figure out where it is, and then it uses GPS to refine that location. So it's a, a fundamentally different system. But there's a companion signal that's going to be part of, of the GPS Block 3 that makes it much faster to acquire the GPS signal. Uh, and there's one other component is there's a there's a, a new uh, uh, localization signal called um, L5 that is part of the uh, transmitted signal. And uh, this is a higher bandwidth signal that uh, will give you finer grain uh, ability to localize yourself. Uh, so the idea is that once GPS block three is fully deployed, uh, you'll be able to get more indoor localization and the uh, the localizations that you see will be uh, on the order of one meter in accuracy. Now, are we still in a situation where uh, the real precise GPS is being limited to the military? Uh, no. Uh, back in the 1990s, the, that feature was activated in the GPS constellation as commercial use uh, began to grow. Um, and uh, there was the civilian GPS versus the military GPS. Uh, but in the early 2000s, uh, the White House approved basically opening up that military level of accuracy to everyone. Um, so there really isn't a difference in the level of precision that the military sees versus the civilian GPS receivers. I see. All right. Well, thanks for filling us in. As always, Dr. Charles Clancy, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at ObserveIt.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Iben, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.